cool, man. I, I love being a dad. I'm a dad of four. And how many know my wife had them? I didn't. How many know I, never mind. I was going to say something to her, but I'm not going to because I don't want to embarrass her. I love, love, love being a dad. I love it. It's one of the greatest joys that I have as a believer in Jesus Christ. We talk to our children. My boys are 39. My daughter, our daughter is 38. Another daughter's 33. We literally talk to them almost every single day, even today. The ones in Arkansas, ones in Southern California, can someone say boo? Boo. Pray that that boy moves to Texas. Come on, pray he moves it. He works for the government, man, so he works for the Air Force. He's not in the Air Force anymore, but he ain't moving. But by God's grace, some miracle is going to happen. And then we got another one that this is kind of cool. We have a daughter and a son-in-law with two of the other grandkids of the five live across the street from us. How many know that that is a cool thing? Until the last three days. Because Tyler is a pilot with United Airlines. He was gone. Candace just so happened to want to take a trip while Tyler was gone. Who do you think watched the grandkids? One is five and one is three. They're all pointing to Crystal. I did my part. I honestly did my part. I did. I did a little bit. A little bit. I got them hyped up on candy and then I left. But man, I love being a dad. I hope that you're here this morning and you've got a great relationship with your children. I pray this morning that you have a great relationship with your wife. I pray this morning, more importantly, that you have a great relationship with your Heavenly Father. Because if you have a great relationship, see, I always think we got to get this before we get this. And if I can get this then God can do a work in me when it comes to this. And see, I, I got brought up, man, color didn't matter. Age didn't matter. amount of money someone made didn't matter. I figure this, if we all cut our wrists, we all got the same color blood, can I get an amen? We just do, we're all the same. And I pray that this morning you are running after Jesus Christ in a way that you've never run after Jesus Christ. I believe that our time on this earth is very, very short. That it goes by in a flicker of a moment, and it goes by faster than we can imagine. I cannot believe I got two boys. I have twin boys. I do, excuse me. We have twin boys that are going to be 40 this year. 40. I know I look 40. Did that get on camera right there? Because that's a lie. I'm lying right now. Sorry. But being a father and being a believer in Jesus Christ, there is nothing more exciting, nothing more glorious, nothing more powerful, nothing more real, nothing more awesome than being a follower of Jesus Christ, especially today. And I believe that we live in the greatest hour, the greatest moment in the history of earth is right now, today. And I know it stinks sometimes. I know our world is messed up sometimes, but how many know that the God that we serve is not messed up? That the God that we serve is never freaking out, never panicking. He's got it in control. He will always have it in control. He is coming back soon with his son, Jesus Christ. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to be in the presence of God. I cannot wait to be in the presence of Jesus. And I don't even know what I want to say first. Except I'm absolutely blown away at the goodness and the graciousness of God. And we're going to look at Matthew 18, and if you could turn there, and I'll grab my Bible, and if you could turn to Matthew chapter 18, and I think you got the scripture. I can't even see y'all. You got the scripture up there, right? Matthew 18, 21 to 35, and I'm going to read something real quick, and then we're going to talk about a couple things. And we're going to walk out of here different. And I'm asking you to do something. I'm asking you to take a risk. I'm asking you to ask the Holy Spirit. Crystal and I do this probably two to three to four times a year where we're, we do devotions almost every night. We pray together every day. It's just part of our routine. We've been married 41 years. How many know that's a lot of putting up with a husband? Uh -huh, don't you excuse me. I know we've... 
known June and Leon for about 30 years, and she was really loud right there, and I really don't appreciate that, but that's fine. <laughs> it's all good, girl, because I know stuff about you that Leon's told me, so. <laughs> We've been married for about 41 years, and our routine is we pray together. I can't say that we do every single solitary day, but we pray together most every day, and we read the word together every day, and it's healed our marriage and strengthened our marriage and made our marriage better. And if you're a father, the one of the greatest things that I could do for you this morning is to tell you to pray with your wife every day and read the word of God with your wife every day, whether you do it in the morning or you do it at night. But read together, pray together, talk together, hold each other's hands, talk about dreams, talk about stuff. And again, we talk about bitterness and unforgiveness every once in a while, like every quarter it seems like, hey, are you doing okay? Because my wife's got a wacky sister. Amen. I got a couple wacky brothers. Family can do things to you that other people can't do to you. And the enemy is really, really good at trying to get you to be bitter and have unforgiveness towards the ones that you love the most, that God loves. So we talk about it all the time, man. Are we free? Because there's something about being free. There's something about not having bitterness and unforgiveness. Because I'm going to tell you a story. I was grilling. Uh, by the way, how many are grillers and how many are barbecues? How many are grillers? I don't understand Texas. I thought y'all would be grillers. How many are barbecuers? Dang, no, well, two. Dude, what is it? Is it grilling or barbecuing in Texas? Barbecuing? See, I got to bet. I bet myself, I bet myself this, that I think it's grilling. In California, it was barbecuing. But they don't know how to do barbecue either. But I thought, you know what? If I'm right, I'm going to buy myself a new pair of shoes. If I'm wrong, I'm going to buy myself a new pair of shoes. Because it's Father's Day, man. And how many know fathers deserve a gift? Amen? So wives, you best be buying your husbands some stuff today. So I was barbecuing, grilling last night, and we were doing burgers. And I don't know if you've ever grilled, but this is something that's common to grillers or barbecuers. And I'm standing in front of the grill, and I opened up the thing. And how many know every time you open up the thing, what comes out? Heat and smoke. And how many know everywhere that you go, the smoke goes? You could go right, it's going to track you. You're going to go left, it's going to track you. Well, it's the same thing with bitterness and unforgiveness. That everywhere that you go and everything that you do, you smell like it. I smelled like barbecue, man. I smelled like hamburger last night. I smelled like smoke last night because every single way I went, that smoke went after me. It's the same thing with bitterness and unforgiveness. It tracks you. It runs after you. You become it. You smell like it. People around you recognize it. They see it on your countenance. I'm a countenance watcher. I love to look at people and watch their faces in their body language and see, like I'm watching you right now. Yeah, you all are smiling. You're good. But I love to watch body language because you can see a person who's bitter and angry, who's got unforgiveness, who has not released it, who has not, better yet, been freed from it. You can look at them and you can tell that there's something going on inside of them that, that if God could just get a hold of the person that is bitter and angry, if God could just get a hold of you and me and set us free, because God is all about, God's DNA is forgiveness. That's who God is. That's the God that we serve, that God is a forgiver. Do you remember the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ? And if you don't remember, you need to remember that the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ, it was not one of the best days of your life. It was the greatest day of your life because now you're free. You're going to heaven. You're not in bondage anymore. You don't do the things that you used to do, and you get to serve perfect. Can I get an amen? That you get to serve perfect. And when you get to serve perfect, there is something about joy 
Jesus said to the disciples all the time, may my peace be with you. May my joy be with you. May my hope be with you. May you walk in forgiveness. And this is going to be a story as we read this. How many know that there's man's way of forgiving and there's God's way of forgiving? And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, here's your option. One, you choose to forgive the way that God does or you harden your heart and you forgive the way that you want to. And you put conditions on it, or it's unconditional. And we're going to read a story out of Matthew 18, verse 21. Peter came to Jesus. Hey, Lord. And dude, I, huh, how many relate to Peter really well? I relate to Peter really well. He stuck his foot in his mouth all the time. And I'll never deny you, Jesus. I promise, man. I don't even care if everybody else does. I will never do it. How many know, man, Peter kind of talked before he thought. He was really, really good at it until he got baptized in the Holy Spirit and then his life changed. That's another day, another story. How many times shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Now watch this. Pharisees and Sadducees would teach three times. Peter ups the Pharisees and the Sadducees and sounds more spiritual than they are because he said seven times. But here's the problem with three and seven. Once you get to two and you get to six, you know you only got to do it one more time and then you don't have to mess with it anymore. God is always calling you to mess with it. Because Jesus said something to Peter and to the other disciples in verse 22. I don't say to you up to seven times. Now, doggone it, Peter. I know Peter thought he was really spiritual with Jesus. Oh, look at me, man. I'm seven. There's three. I'm seven. Look at me. I'm awesome, Jesus. I'm awesome. Look at how awesome I am. And Jesus said, I don't say up to seven times. Now, watch this. There is man's way of doing things as a believer in Jesus Christ. And there is God's way of doing things as a believer in Jesus Christ. Why does Jesus say, I hate this at times, love your enemy? How many know that is one of the hardest? You know what it also means? You got to love you. Because sometimes you are your greatest enemy. Sometimes you don't even need the enemy to be your enemy because you're the greatest enemy and you got to love your enemy and your enemy is you. And there are times that you do things that you do. Man, I guess, how many wish you could take stuff back? How many wish you could go, dude, you know what? I wish I could take it back. I can't take it back. But you know what you can do? You can do the next thing right. So Jesus says to him, I don't say to you up to seven times, Peter, and all the other disciples were there listening to. So Peter's not getting rebuked. Everybody's getting rebuked. And Jesus says up to 70 times seven. Give me math majors. How many times is that? 490 for the same sin in the same day for the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. If you are up for 16 hours a day and you sleep for eight, if you're a new mother and there were some new mothers in here, you ain't sleeping no eight hours. You're probably sleeping too. But if you are a normal human being and you sleep eight hours, that's 30 times an hour that you've got to forgive the person for the same thing that they did to you over and over and over and over and over again. I'm going to say this to you. Forgiveness is a full-time job with overtime. Forgiveness is a full-time job with overtime, that you as a believer in Jesus Christ got to forgive others their wrong. You've got to forgive yourself the wrong that you've done, the wrong that you've committed, the hurt that you've caused, and you've got to continually forgive yourself over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. There is no limit, three or seven. 490 is not possible. It's just a number that, that Jesus threw out there to go, and you can't forgive somebody 490 times for the same offense in the same day, day after day after day after day after day after day after day. It's not possible. There is man's way. There is God's way. 
God's way is unlimited. Man's way is limited. So he says to him, hey, there's a kingdom of heaven. It's like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Do you remember when Jesus wanted to settle accounts with you? Do you remember when you gave your life to Jesus Christ? Do you remember when you said yes to Jesus Christ and he settled accounts with you and you owed him a debt that you could never pay back and you did things that you wish you could take back? I remember mocking God as a golf pro in the 1970s, making fun of Bible preachers. Ah, oh, the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. And I remember mocking God and laughing at God and saying, God, I don't want anything to do with you. You're weird. Because how many know Christians are weird? Can I get an Amen. We're weird and a good. I'm, I'm one of those weird Christians. I'm one of the weirdos. Man, because I love God. I love people. I want to see God do great stuff in people. But God is saying, and Jesus is saying, 70 times 7. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him that owed him 10,000 talents. I'm going to say something to you. You know how much 10,000 talents is? It's 100, you ready? And 60,000, not dollars. It's 160,000 years, think about what I just said, of wages. If you made $50,000 a year, and I'll be conservative, if you made $50,000 a year for 160,000, how many, by the way, know that that's a long time? That's a long time, man, 160,000 years. That equals... Eight trillion dollars that this man in today's money was in debt to the master. I have no clue. How many have ever been in debt? Come on, raise your hand. How many are in debt? How many have ever been eight trillion dollars in debt? You would not be here right now. You'd be bumming money like crazy. 160,000 years of wages, this man owed the master. Here's what I love about God. Well, man, why'd the master let him get that far in debt? You know why God lets you do the things that you do? Is because he's not sovereign over your will. God can't make you do something. God can't tell you what to do. God can only woo you by his Holy Spirit to get you to the place. That's why, here's what's cool about God. He never gives up on you. Never, never. He never gives up on you. He'll never give up on you. Never, never. Why the thief on the cross? Never done anything right in his life. He was a bad guy. He was a criminal. And he said to Jesus, you know what? I want to go with you in the kingdom. I want to be with you. That guy never went to church. That guy never tithed. That guy never went to a Bible class. That guy probably never read the word of God. He just had a moment of clarity that said, you know what? I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. I want to be with you. That's the kind of God that we serve. Can I get an amen? That's who we serve. Is that kind of God. 10,000 talents, 160,000 hours or years of wages, eight trillion dollars that this man owed the master, but he's, he was not able to pay. Say, no, duh. Say, no, duh. Seriously, how do you pay that back? His master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and that payment be made. Here's what I'm going to say to you about unforgiveness and bitterness. It not only affects you, it affects the ones you love. It not only hurts you, it hurts your family. It not only hurts you, it hurts your wife. It not only hurts you, it hurts your kids. Because I'm going to tell you something. As a dad, you're passing stuff on to your children. And if you're passing on bitterness and unforgiveness to your children, they pick up on it. There comes an age where kids, I was a youth pastor. The thing that was amazing about being a youth pastor, you could never fool them. They got you. They can read you like crazy. They know if you're real or not. They know if you're true or not. They know if you're speaking truth or not. They know if you're fake and phony or not. Well, there comes a time when your children, dads, they're watching you. 
They're checking you to see how you handle situations. They're checking you how you teach and, and treat your wives, your wife, wives, your wife. If you have wives in here, come talk to me. They watch you, and they pick up on stuff, and you pass on to them what is going on inside of you. That's why it's critical as a believer in Jesus Christ to eradicate bitterness and unforgiveness, to give it no place, to quickly forgive. There is something about bitterness and unforgiveness that the quicker you forgive, the quicker you're free. And the quicker you're free, the quicker you can go on and be the man or the woman that God has called you to be. Because every single one of us, you don't think Jesus has reason to be bitter? Dude, he watches us every single day. Watches this world turn their back on him every single day. And I praise God that God is not a God. Yeah, yeah judgment's going to come. I know all that. I get all that. But God is a God of grace. And God is a God of forgiveness. And when you ask God truly from your heart to forgive you, God will forgive you and heal you and restore you no matter what you've done. But your children, they're watching you. Dads, they're watching you. My boys are 39. My daughter, again, is 38. My other daughter's 33. They watch me and mom, me and Crystal, how we treat each other. They have seen nothing but a great marriage. They've seen nothing. Yeah, we have problems. How many know you're married for more than eight minutes? You got problems. <laughs> Give me a break. It ain't Disneyland all the time. But they've watched their mother and their father. We've been married 41 years. We're going on 42 years. I talked to somebody at first service They've been married 60. How many know that's a long time? I go, how do you stay married? They go, well, we just we stay married. We made a commitment to each other. Back 60 years, and he goes, I don't remember what I said, but I laughed. Verse 25, as he was not able to pay his master, commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had, and that payment be made. And the servant therefore fell down. Now watch this, watch. I want to take you back to when you gave your life to Jesus Christ. I want to take you back to that day that you gave your life to Jesus and you truly repented and you truly said yes and you truly said, Jesus, I give you my life. I don't want you to just be my Savior. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to take over control of my life because when you give your life to Jesus Christ, it's not what you want anymore. It's what he has for you because he always has greatness and the best for you. Can I get an amen? Always, always. It says, as he was not able to pay, his master commanded it again. He threw he and his, his wife and his children and all they had and payment be made. And the servant therefore fell down, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I'm going to pay you all. You and I did that. When we gave our lives to Jesus Christ, and if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, and you're dabbling in it, and you're checking it out, and you're wondering if God's real, I'm going to tell you right now, there is nothing on this planet that is more real than the relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing. I know this world looks like it has a ton of stuff to offer. But here's what I know about sin. It only promises to serve and to please, but its only desire is to enslave and dominate. I'm going to say that again over here because you all didn't say amen. Sin promises to serve and to please, but its only desire is to enslave and dominate you. That's what sin does. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. How many know that's a lot of patience to pay back $8 trillion? And the master of that servant, this is what blows me away more than the indebtedness of the slave. What blows me away more is the forgiveness of the master and the compassion of the master and the forgiveness of the God we serve and the compassion of the God that we serve. And the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, forgave him the debt. There is something about being released. See, we don't like the fact that there is a hell and we don't like... 
and sometimes believe that there really is a heaven. But how many know there is a heaven and there is a hell? And the only way that you go to heaven is to give your life to Jesus Christ, to make him Lord and Savior of your life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through me. John 14, 6. There literally is only one way to go to heaven, and that is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Servant went out. Now, I don't get this. If my master forgave me $8 trillion, the first thing I'm doing is I'm calling my wife. Because my wife was knowing we're going to prison. And now we're not going to prison. And hey, babe, check it out. He just forgave me and forgave us $8 trillion. And we're not going to jail anymore, babe. We're free. We're free. We're free. The second you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you were free. You don't have to be bitter anymore. You don't have to be angry anymore. You don't have to have unforgiveness anymore. You can just be a free man or a free woman. And I know they hurt you. I know they wronged you. I know they did stuff to you. But it pales in comparison to what we've done to God. Babe, we're free! Listen, as quiet as my wife is, my wife would freak out if I called her up and just told her our house was paid for cash. This guy had everything paid for. Eight trillion dollars worth of debt, free, 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 free. Cancel, 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 cancel. I'm not holding it against you anymore. But here's what happens. Look at verse 28, but. It's one of the biggest buts in Scripture, and I'm not trying to be rude right now. But. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And it should say this. And he went up to him and he goes, dude, you know what? I just got forgiven like millions and millions and trillions of dollars. I'm free. I want to free you too. You know how much a hundred denarii is? It's, a, it's six months pay. It's nothing. Compared to eight trillion, it's nothing. He owed him nothing compared to the eight trillion dollars that he had just been forgiven. A hundred denarii is nothing. And here's what he did. He didn't say, hey, man, I'm going to release you. Hey, I'm going to free you. Everything's cool. Everything's great. Don't worry about it. Go live your life, man. Let's just not get in debt anymore. Let's rejoice together that we've been freed. He didn't do that. He laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe me. When you harbor bitterness, when you harbor unforgiveness as a believer in Jesus Christ, you take that person by the throat and you hold them captive because here's the deal. You're never going to make them understand how bad they hurt you. They'll never understand. But here's what happens. When you release them and when you free them, you are free. Their response is almost irrelevant. Because when you free somebody from bitterness and unforgiveness, you're now free. You have joy. You have peace. You have power. And I don't know about you. I want to walk around in what we call the anointing. I want to have people see Jesus Christ in me. I want to love on people unconditionally and speak love and life to people and love people unconditionally. But I can't do it if I'm in bondage to bitterness and unforgiveness. I can't do it. And this is one of the greatest verses in all of Scripture that I don't understand. Look at verse 30 of Matthew 18. It said something. I don't understand this. I'm just being real. I don't understand this. I've dealt with bitterness and unforgiveness my whole life. Crystal and I have had our moments where we're going, man, we got to choose to forgive each other. We got to. We got to forgive each other, man. I don't want, I don't want to be held, that, held against me. I don't want my prayers hindered. But this is what I don't understand in all of this. He'd been forgiven a debt. And you know what? The massiveness of the debt doesn't matter. It's the fact that God set you free from a debt that you could never pay back. And it goes on to say in verse 30, and I would encourage you to underline this, highlight it, yellow it. And it says, it does not say he could not. It says he would not. This man chose, who just been forgiven a debt that he could never pay back, 
He chose to hold somebody at ransom for a hundred days' pay compared to his eight trillion dollars that was forgiven, and it said he wouldn't. We have a choice as a believer in Jesus Christ to forgive the ones that have wronged us and hurt us. And I'm not so dumb into thinking some of the stuff that's happened to some of us has been really lousy. It's been rotten. It's not fair. It's not right. It hurts. But here's what I understand. That he said again in verse 30, he would not, but he went and he threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. And I don't understand that either. How do you throw someone into prison to make them pay the debt? How do you make money in prison? I don't understand that. I don't understand the attitude. We used to, when our kids were young, we'd always say, you got a GA or you got a BA? And GA was a good attitude and a BA was a bad attitude. This guy had a BA, a really bad BA. He had a really bad attitude. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved. And they came and told their master all that had been done. Then the master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant. He was, five minutes ago, he was a free servant. Five minutes ago, he'd been released. Now he's a wicked servant. Do you understand that as a believer in Jesus Christ, if you harbor bitterness and unforgiveness, we're wicked. Don't like that. I don't even like saying it. But I know what the Bible says. And I know what God expects. And I know that if you've got bitterness and unforgiveness in your life right now, God wants to do a work in you and give you the courage and give you the strength to go, you know what, I'm just going to release it, God, by faith. Say it with me, by faith, by faith. I'm going to give it to you, by faith. You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was now angry. We think of God sometimes as this God who's gracious. But there is a side to God that is a judgment side of God. Yes, God loves everybody. But God hates sin. I'm going to say it again. Yes, God loves everybody. But God hates sin. Bitterness and unforgiveness and holding resentment is sin. And when you and I hold bitterness and resentment against another person. And what are you going, man? Come on, man. You have no idea what has happened to me. I don't, but God does. You don't know how hard it is. I don't, but I know God does. I know that God will help you forgive. I know God will help you release. Listen, can I say this? Forgiveness is given. Trust is earned. Forgiveness is given. Trust is earned. It doesn't mean that you trust them again. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden now you're best buddies. Forgiveness is given because it heals you. Trust is earned. It's earned. So watch. You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt and I'm almost done because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had had pity on you? And his master was angry, and he delivered him over to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. One doctor said that he believes that 80% of the people that are in hospitals with really bad ailments are there because of bitterness and unforgiveness. And I don't know if that's true. But I know that bitterness and unforgiveness can bring a cancer to your life that joy and peace can't. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you, watch this, from his or her heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Flip over real quick and then I'm done. Matthew chapter 6. There are some verses in Scripture that I wish didn't say what it says. But how many know that you learn to trust the Father? Because I, I, I want to say it again. God's always got the best for you. Always. God always wants the best for you. 
God always wants freedom for you. God always wants joy for you. God always wants hope for you. And look at Matthew 6, 14 and 15, and I'm going to end with this. That if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. It's a condition. It's an if and a then. If you will forgive, then God will forgive. But watch what it says in verse 15. And we don't like this. Because you're like, God, don't you know what happened to me? Don't you know how bad they were? I could tell you stories right now that we don't have time for of some things that I know that have happened to people that I go, I don't even know how another human being could do a thing like that to another human being. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't know how. But look what it says in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 6. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, I'm going to say it again. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. That is one of the scariest, coolest, awesomest, scariest verses in all of Scripture. So what are you telling me? That if someone wrongs me and I don't forgive them, I'm standing in judgment? You're standing in judgment. And you're standing in a place where God cannot forgive you. No wonder why we see marriages go through difficulty. And I don't even know who I'm talking to right now. But you have bitterness and unforgiveness in your marriage. And you can't see your marriage be healed until you free one another from the bitterness and the unforgiveness. God wants to heal your marriage and restore your marriage. And I'm just going to say this. This is real. We've been married 41 years, and there was a time, a long, long time ago, don't judge me, where we were going through a really, really hard time. I didn't like my wife a whole lot. I think she liked me less. But I was praying that God would take my wife. Because, God, I can't handle this stuff anymore. I don't want to deal with this stuff anymore. I don't like her. She doesn't like me. Our marriage stinks. We were born again. We were believers in Jesus Christ. And we had bitterness and we had unforgiveness. And, again, this is a long, long time ago. If you're here this morning and you've got bitterness and unforgiveness, this is kind of the heavy part of the message, God wants to free you. God wants to help you forgive. God wants to help you release it so that you can be free, so that you can be the man that God's called you to be and the woman that God's called you to be. And listen, here's the deal. If you're involved in church and you're looking for the perfect church, how many know the second you walk into church is now imperfect? There ain't no perfect churches. Our church, we have a great church. We don't have a perfect church. You're never going to find a perfect church because the second you walk in it and I walk in it, we just imperfect it. But what we do have is a church that is a family that loves Jesus Christ, that preaches the word of God, that believes the best for you. I'm going to encourage you with something. If you're struggling with bitterness and unforgiveness and you can't handle it on your own and you're having a real big struggle with it, there's something about two or more gathered here in the midst of us, God's in the midst. You find somebody that can help you through it. You find somebody that will help pray you through it. You help with, with, with helping to, to get free from it. And here's the deal. You may have to go to the person that you got bitterness and unforgiveness towards, and you may have to go, you know what, forgive me for having bitterness and unforgiveness. But the second you do that, you're free. The second you do it, you're free. You're free. You have joy. You have peace. You have authority. You're walking like Jesus did. Because how many know that Jesus said it all the time? He forgave all the time. He said to Peter, you know what, knucklehead? Get behind me, Satan. What? He said that to Peter. How many know Jesus forgave Peter, but how many know Peter forgave Peter? That's what's awesome about the gospel. You know what? When you mess up, I'm going to say that. I don't even know who this is for. When you mess up, you ready? This is really deep theological. Fess up. 
I'm going to say it again. When, when, when you mess up, fess up. Just fess up. You messed up. Can I tell you something? Every time you mess up and do it in front of your wife, what she knows. How many know she knows? How many married the Holy Spirit? How many know what I'm talking about? You guys have been married like seven months and you already know that. When you mess up, all you got to do is fess up. We need great leaders in the body of Christ. I'm so sick of charismatic, good-looking, flaky, weird, don't preach the gospel preachers. I'm so tired of it. We need to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the realness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't need a man to lead us. We need the Spirit of God to lead us. I'm going to read this verse one more time. If you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father is going to forgive you. If you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father is going to forgive you. But if you do not... Now, again, it's back to he would not. It's not back to he could not. It's back to he would not. Then your trespasses, neither will your father forgive you your trespasses. So I don't know where Corey is. I don't know if somebody can play, but I want you to stand up, and we're going to pray. One, I hope you got something out of this. It's kind of a heavy message. 